I am uh, Hugh Patrick uh, from the Columbia Business School Center on Japanese Economy and Business. I welcome you to this special lecture co-sponsored by the Weatherhead East Asian Institute and the Center on Japanese Economy and Business. Uh, one of my honors and pleasures at Columbia is to introduce today's speaker on special occasions such as this. Uh, Professor Gerald Curtis, Burgess Professor of Political Science. Um, as many students in the audience know, Professor Curtis teaches a very popular course on Japanese politics and another one on uh, U.S. relations with East Asia. Uh, he also spends a good deal of time in, in Japan where he is a frequent uh, guest commentator on Sunday morning news programs on TV. So, I remember being pretty shocked one morning, cutting on the TV, sort of in a, in a hotel in Japan, and there was Jerry staring at me. Uh, 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 he regularly publishes uh, columns both in Japanese and English language newspapers. I, I think he is the most knowledgeable specialist on Japanese politics, not only in the United States, but anywhere in the world outside of Japan. Uh, and of course, I'm unbiased. Uh, this is Professor Curtis's ninth annual le uh, lecture on Japanese politics given at Columbia and hosted by CJEB and the Weatherhead East Asian Institute. He is in a unique position uh, to give this lecture and to keep on giving this lecture and he has to do it again next year. He was sort of saying, why am I doing this? And that's because we asked him to. Uh, he's really unique, uh, uniquely qualified because He's known every Japanese prime minister pretty well for the last 30 years, except one person who only lasted two months. Uh, and in, what's really impressive for me is that he knows and meets with leaders from across the political spectrum, uh, the Liberal Democratic Party, LDP, uh, the Democratic Party of Japan, DPJ, Komeito, and others. Uh, he has an extraordinary network of politicians, business leaders, and government officials in Japan. Uh, he's developed this uh, sort of irreplaceable insider-outsider set of relationships. He's an outsider because he's not Japanese, he's an academic, and he has no particular hidden agenda or uh, ax to grind. He's an insider because he is fluent in Japanese, uh, because he's trusted by Japanese when they have private conversations with him not to reveal uh, those conversations, and because he can and does express his own views very frankly, both in private and public fora. Uh, for the last six or so years that uh, Professor Curtis has been giving this a lecture, and I'm sure he'll comment on it, it's always been just after there's been a new prime minister. Uh, and in, indeed, uh, there was always a new prime minister from the previous year. And in fact, that's true this year. But this is different. Uh, as you know, uh, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe is firmly in place and seems set to, to rule for at least the next three years. Uh, the, the political and economic environment in Japan, and Japan is undergoing major changes, and public sentiment has become much more optimistic, at least to my eye, but we'll hear what Jerry has to say about that. Uh, following the lecture, we'll have time for, for some Q&A. I ask you to please identify yourself, your institution, but please keep your question short uh, so that we can address as many as possible. We're scheduled to end here about 5.45, and then we will have a reception uh, just outside this room, and that will run to uh, 6, 6.30. Uh, so that will be a chance for you to uh, meet more informally with him, uh, though he probably will be surrounded by people, and to chat with each other. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to hearing what Professor Curtis has to say. Uh, the title of his lecture is, as you know, Abe and the LDP are back. What now? Uh, question mark. Uh, Jerry? Let me make sure I don't take your notes. I'm taking speech. I'm taking your speech. Yeah. No. Yeah. I like it.
like it. <laughs> Thanks, Hugh. Uh, sitting here <clears throat> while Hugh was giving that introduction, two thoughts came to mind. First is, and this is good. This is advice to all of you. It's always a good idea to ask your best friend to introduce you, <laughs> so that they have all kinds of nice complimentary things to say. The other thought I had sitting in this room was, I've been teaching here forever. Actually, I've been teaching here about 40 years, and you would think I would know the campus by this point, but I didn't know that this building even existed. Um, so it was both a pleasant introduction to listen to and a, and a pleasure to see this room full. I would like to think that you all came because you're really interested in what I have to say, uh, but I think probably the main reason is that, you know, Japan is suddenly interesting again. Um, Abe, Abenomics, um, problems with China and Korea, um, and so on, I think have brought Japan back a little bit, at least a little bit more in the public consciousness than was, has been true over the past, um, the past several years. So, you know, usually I, I kind of ad lib this thing and do it off the cuff, but I don't know what possessed me. The last couple of days I've been sitting in front of my computer um, and writing, and I ended up writing out what I think is a speech. Uh, so I'll be reading part of it and, and then talking part of it and trying not to um, talk longer than, than I'm scheduled to talk, which is about 40, 45 minutes or so. And I want to cover both the domestic situation and Japanese foreign policy and the so-called history issue uh, to, as much as I can and then leave it to you to ask me questions. So, Japan once again has a new prime minister. I gave this speech last year. The prime minister was Mr. Noda. Uh, they got the timing a little bit screwed up. Usually, prime ministers have gone out of office about a week before I give my autumn speech. That's what happened with Mr. Abe. Uh, he quit, and I think it was three days later I had to give, uh, had to give the talk. The last time he was prime minister, it's happened almost every year. But Noda hung, hung on a little longer than he should have. And, uh, stayed until December. But so, you know, it's a new prime minister. I'll be very surprised if when I come back here next year, now that I got orders from my boss to come back and give this talk again, uh, that I'd be really surprised if Mr. Abe is not prime minister. He can be prime, and I'll be surprised if he's not prime minister the year after that, and probably the year after that. As long as his health holds up, uh, you know, he, he got very ill the last time and he has a chronic health condition, which is under control, as long as his health is okay, I think we're in for a period of, um, of uh, political stability under an LDP government led by, uh, by Abe Shinzo. So, um, so, you know, Japan has a new prime minister, and by any measure, um, this prime minister, Mr. Abe, is doing really well. The economy is improving. His popularity ratings are very high. I checked, they're higher for him than they were for Prime Minister Koizumi at a comparable point uh, in, Ko in Koizumi's tenure as, uh, as, as Prime Minister. Relations with the U.S. are good. He's been careful in his comments on foreign policy and on history issues to try not to say things that would further escalate tensions with China and Korea. He has had a grueling schedule of overseas travel um, uh, uh, making and has been making, where he's been making a stronger case for a leadership role for Japan in regional and global affairs than any prime minister in recent memory. <clears throat> and as you probably know, there's an optimism in the public mood about the future um, that has not been seen for years. And the icing on top of the cake for Mr. Abe was the success in uh, getting the Olympics for 2020, for which I am personally very grateful and very happy because I got the title of my, uh, probably my final book, from, from, the, from the Tokyo Olympics to the Tokyo Olympics. My, I first set foot in Japan in the summer of 1964 when I went to study Japanese language. That was the summer of the 1964 Tokyo Olympics. And if I'm fortunate enough, to, fortunate enough to still be around in 2020, they'll be the Tokyo Olympics again. So for me, they're the two big bookends 
on my uh, adult life as a specialist on, on Japan. Now, you know, with this uh, victory that the LDP had in the July upper house election, coming on top of its lopsided uh, victory in the December, last December 2012 lower house contest, Japan no longer has a so-called twisted diet, this nejide jokyo. Uh, that is a parliament where the party that the party or party coalition that controls the majority in the lower house doesn't have a majority in the upper house. That's passed. So, for the first time in many years, political stability has returned to Japan. And as I said at the opening, assuming that Mr. Abe's health remains good, and so far he looks very vigorous, uh, the chances are better than not that he'll be prime minister for several years. So that's really the good news. But the political news out of Japan is not all good news. Uh, and I think my job here today is to try to see through the government's self-congratulatory PR and Wall Street's enthusiasm for Abenomics and to try to make as balanced and as fair an assessment of what's going on in Japan as I can. So let me suggest, first of all, why all is not well in Abe land. <clears throat> first of all, and really importantly, and this is not in any sense Mr. Abe's responsibility, the effort to create a new competitive two-party system, that was the key goal of the political reforms of the 1990s, has been a dismal failure. It's failed dramatically. The political opposition is weaker today than at any point in the entire post-war period. That's a big statement. It's weaker today than at any point in the entire post-war period, and no sign that it's going to recover anytime soon. So a brief retrospective is kind of worthwhile here about Japanese politics. You know, during the, there were long years, 40 years or so, the LD, of so-called LDP one-party dominance, there were two powerful sources of opposition to the government. And they acted as a check on power and created a Japanese-style system of checks and balances. One was the opposition parties. So granted, they commanded at best, a third of the seats in the Diet, which was just enough to prevent constitutional revision, which has been an LDP objective ever since the party was formed in 1955. But they made up for their small numbers with the intensity of the support of those who voted for them and sympathy for their positions on constitutional revision, on defense policy, on the reintroduction of moral education, and other issues from people who voted largely for reasons of personal connections for LDP candidates. So the opposition was, was you know, was a minority, it was, was, was the opposition. It was not, it, it didn't, couldn't come to, didn't come to power, but it had power to check the, um, the, uh, the, the government. That opposition, the formal political party opposition, has all but imploded the DPJ, Democratic Party of Japan, it made a mess out of the opportunity it was given to govern. Too divided internally to come up with a coherent strategy. Instead of trying to co-opt the bureaucrats behind its policies, it attacked them as kind of the enemy uh, of political leadership. And its first prime minister, Mr. Hapiyama, alienated the Obama administration right off the bat with half-baked uh, ideas about forming an East Asian community and by sticking out a position on the removal of this marine air base at Tema in, um, in, 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 in Ginoa and Oki, in Okinawa uh, from, uh, from Okinawa Prefecture and preferably from Japan altogether and then backing off under, your, under American pressure. And I must say, the Obama administration, uh, instead of trying to work with the new DPJ government, instead, right, off, right away, expressed outrage that, it was, that the government was not willing to do exactly what the Americans wanted it to do about Tema, China relations, and other issues. So, you know, here in the States, we take it for granted. We get a new government in Washington, some policy, important policy changes, will occur. But Washington, you know, it's not used to seeing power change 
hands from one party to another in Tokyo and wasn't prepared to accept that a new Japanese government might try to do the same, change policies. Um, the result, you know what happened, you know, Hatayama. Um, I never thought he was anti-American, a Japanese version of Mahathir, which is what people in the Obama administration dealing with Asia uh, uh, were, were arguing with me. Um, but flaky, everybody knows. So he turned out to be a bad news for the DPJ, and the DPJ, you know, is now gone. I mean, is, is, was, was, was what was, was defeated. And I think to, to give you the sort of a, a you know, the, the, the academic um, uh, important uh, sort of s systemic point, what this DPJ debacle uh, shows, has shown, is that the idea of create, that, that the creation of a single member district system would create a two party system, it was flawed in conception. Um, I've talked about this before, because you weren't here, most of you were in, it, were in that previous lectures I've given on this subject, but it's okay. I've talked about it before, I'm not going into detail, but the point is this. Once parties that wanted to be in power, um, that sought a majority, re realized they had to go after the so-called median voter, that is, a broad-based constituency, um, uh, rather than the 20% or so of constituents you needed to win a seat in the old multi-member district system. Now you needed 51% before you, to get elected as a candidate. Now you need, be, you know, before you needed only, say, 20% because there were several members in each, in each district. Once that system changed, and this, for some reason, it was obvious to some of us, but, but not to the people who, pulled, who pushed for this political reform. Once this system changed, they ended up pushing parties to adopt essentially the same policies. And after a couple of years in power, the DPJ moved increasingly toward the LDP's position on key issues. Consumption tax increase. This is an LDP idea. This wasn't a DPJ idea to begin with. Consumption tax increase. A security policy virtually indistinguishable from the LDP's. Who was the defense minister for the last DPJ prime minister, Mr. Noda? His name was Mr. Morimoto, who was the defense advisor to Prime Minister Aso when Mr. Aso was the LDP uh, uh, president. Um, so I think what happened, in addition to lots of other things, was that voters finally decided if they're going to get a party like the LDP anyway, they might as well get the real thing. And they brought the LDP back. Uh, and not with great enthusiasm. This needs to be understood. The size of the popular vote, the number of votes, LDP candidates got in 2012, the election in 2012 in December, when it trounced the DPJ, the number was less than the number it got in 2009 when it lost power to the DPJ. <clears throat> the reason, of course, you know, why that happened, I mean, how that could happen, is that the total vote was so much lower in 2012 because a lot of people didn't bother to vote, disgusted with the choices, un unhappy with the choices that, that, they were, that they were offered. And a lot of minor parties, you know, this uh, uh, Hashimoto and his old, the Ishino Kai and a bunch of, in, and, and the, your party and others, um, took votes away from the DPJ allowing the LDP candidate to win a plurality in these single member districts. So, uh, the LDP didn't win the election as much as the DPJ lost the election. Under this political, under this um, election system that is totally inappropriate for a society like, like, uh, like Japan's, where you don't have the heterogeneity, race, ethnicity, region, and so on that we have in the U.S., class, uh, you know, class uh, uh, inequalities and so on, as to the extent we have, we have here. So here, you know, the Democrats and the Republicans each build their support on the basis of distinct social coalitions. In Japan, they're all going after the same people, the same voters, the same people. So it stands to reason they end up saying pretty much the same thing. Then the argument becomes who's more handsome, who speaks better. Um, 
uh, you know, things that, that happen in other, you know, in, other in, in, in our country as well. But in Japan, it becomes even more of a problem. So, so to, for, to the LDP's credit, the Secretary General of the LDP, a man named Mr. Ishiba, when the results came out and he gave his first talk, and I heard, and in speeches ever since, he always says pretty much at the beginning of the speech, we did not win this election in 2012. The DPJ lost the election. We have to be humble and earn the public's trust. Really smart, whether he believes that or not. This, you know, humility is a, is a characteristic that Japanese appreciate. Um, uh, I'm not sure it goes over all that well if an American politician says, I didn't really win the election, the other guy lost it, but now I gotta really work hard to earn your trust. People say, what is this, who, who is this guy? What is he talking about? Here you say, you know, I'm so grateful you really realized that I was terrific. Um, but anyway, I'm gonna, I'll leave, I'll, I, won't, I won't go there. Um, uh, so, uh, so, I think, and, and, I, I'll, and I stress this point to you. The LDP that came back in 2012 was in an important sense a very different party from the party that lost power three years earlier in 2009. It learned something from that defeat, which is that the interest groups that had long been the backbone of LDP electoral strength proved themselves unable to deliver enough votes to keep the party in power. That's a big shock to the LDP. All these uh, interest groups JA, you know, the agricultural lobby, the, the, the uh, Ishikai, the, the medical association, and many others. They didn't do what they're supposed to do for the LDP. They didn't deliver the vote. The LDP lost. Uh, and, and so I think the LDP understands, as it never did before, uh, to an extent that it, that it never did before, that it has to appeal to a broad-based electorate much more, much more energetically and not allow itself to be captured by the special interests that had failed it. That, among other reasons, is an important reason why Abe decided to join the TPP negotiations. He is not so scared about JA. JA didn't do the job for him. That is the agricultural lobby. Urban voters don't see a big problem with Japan having a more open um, economy and, uh, and joining TPP. And I think, so I think this election defeat was, a, was good medicine for the LDP. Special interest is still very important. God only knows in any of our you know, democratic politics, they're all too important. Maybe more so here than, 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 in, than in Japan. So, but they're important, but not like it was before. And so the party is trying to appeal much more, much more directly to the public. Uh, and this is just an, it's a very interesting process of social change and political change that's been going on in Japan for quite a while, but that came to kind of a head uh, in the election in 2009 when they, when they lost. So I said, you know, the, the opposition has never been weaker, but in post-war Japan, the opposition was not only from the opposition parties, the opposition from was, from was, was from within the factional system in the LDP. So factions, you know, in the LDP uh, fought not only over power, but over policy. There was all, there's always been a very strong right-wing contingent in the LDP, advocating historical revisionism, constitutional change, a more robust security policy. But this right-wing group, represented by people like Prime Minister Abe's grandfather, Prime Minister Kishi, if you go to Yasukuni Shrine, there's a, uh, the proclamation of, uh, you know, uh, authorizing the attack on Pearl Harbor signed by the members of the cabinet of, of Prime Minister Tojo in 1941. And there is the name of the man who became prime minister in 1957, Kishi Nobusuke, the father of Shinzo Abe's mother. <clears throat> there's always been a strong right wing, uh, wing, a right wing group in the LDP, but it's always been balanced. In the past, it was balanced. Um, and checkmated, if you will, by the power of the economic pragmatists represented by Prime Minister Ikeda, Ohira, 
Miyazawa, and others in a group that was called the Kochikai, a faction called the Kochikai, who were in alliance with the pork barrel constituency service politics of the faction led by Prime Minister Tanaka. It was that combination, the economic pragmatists and the mostly former bureaucrats uh, in the Kochikai, and the, you know, still got mud on their shoes, um, uh, professional politicians in the Tanaka faction that knew how to distribute the pork. That was the combination that balanced off the right and that kept the LDP in power and kept the system on center. Well, that factional balance is gone. <clears throat> Abe is in a stronger position than any LDP leader in recent years. That's really good news for Abe, but it's not a healthy situation for Japan. Stability is coming at the price of competitive politics. So, you know, democratic politics, I'm, and this isn't a criticism, I'm not criticizing him for being in a great position, you know, good for him, but it's not a healthy situation when a country doesn't have a truly competitive party system. Um, you know, democracy requires a strong opposition. Democracy is defined by the existence of competition between the party in power and those that want to replace it. Uh, defined by elections that offer voters a real choice. So there's an interesting contrast, obviously, here to be drawn between Japan and the U.S. In the U.S., our politics have become so polarized and our election system so manipulated that in many congressional districts, only incumbents have a reasonable chance of getting elected, even though they represent the views of a minority. That's our problem. In Japan, it's almost the opposite. The opposite of polarization has occurred. And that also deprives voters of a real choice. So my view is the Japanese electorate is not shifting to the right as so many commentators, especially in, uh, in Korea and Japan and, in, and China and here in the US as well, um, often allege it's not shifting. The public isn't shifting to the right. There's really no evidence of that. But in the context of an extremely weak competitive party system and the dominant position, now really dominant position of the more rightward leaning elements in the LDP, there is a danger of a kind of drift to the right. Uh, voters may not actively and do not actively support some of Mr. Abe's more nationalistic views, but the intensity of the opposition has really of the, to them has diminished. And parties and leaders that used to voice persuasive criticism of those right-wing views have mostly disappeared. I'll come back to this in a minute. But now, let me switch gears a little bit. What can we say about Mr. Abe's performance to date? I think, you know, the first point to be made is how different he is from when he was prime minister the last time, what, six years ago? He really learned lessons from his previous, uh, this, you know, terrible experience. He only lasted a year. Uh, lost the upper house election, uh, got a terrible stomach, you know, tummy ache, and quit. Um, I checked the record of when I spoke here right after, it was only a few days after Abe resigned. When I spoke here this, to this you know, annual lecture in 2007, I said that Abe was forced out by the public's three Three no's. I don't know where I came up with that. I must have been reading, must have been reading too much about Chinese politics in those days. Uh, uh, he was forced out by the public's three no's. No to the emphasis on constitutional revision, creating a beautiful country, and other issues that were not relevant to the public's concerns about their economic future. No to his apparent lack of management skills as reflected in his cabinet appointments, you know, a cabinet of friends, you know, Tomodachi Naikaku, uh, and his vacillation when cabinet ministers made gaffes or otherwise got themselves into trouble. 
and no to his lack of attention to the needs of average people, average working people. Those were the three no's that cost him his job. I think Abe heard these voices. Uh, no longer does he have a cabinet of friends. He's tried with remarkable success, given the usual pattern in Japan, to keep his cabinet ministers from straying away from his policy line. He doesn't let them say things that differ with what his position is. Um, uh, and he's not following the traditional LDP policy of shuffling cabinet positions every six months or so. <clears throat> the, media, you know, the media is always slow to, to grasp what is going on, what's going on, and I think they're, they tend to, particularly the political reporting in Japan, tends to assume that the way the, the, the rules of the game, if they've been applied in the past, continue to operate. Um, so the media assumed, expected, and wrote that after the upper house election, there of course would be a cabinet change. Who's gonna get now in the cabinet? Will they replace Mr. Amadi, the economic minister, with somebody who's gonna push for a, you know, great for more for one way or another? This was, there's a lot of media coverage of this. But Abe decided no cabinet reshuffle, no cabinet minister is gonna be replaced, at least until next spring or summer. That's a big deal. That's really important. That means the people he appointed in December uh, when he became prime minister are gonna be around for year and, year and a half. That's the only way to get political control over the policy process. You know, it takes a while. You become minister and you gotta learn, first you gotta get to know, the, you gotta know and get along with the bureaucrats in your ministry if you can get anything done. Where is that not true? It's true here, you know, Cabinet ministers here, Secretary of State or whatever, or Treasury, who do they listen to? They listen to the people who work for them. They're bureaucrats. It's the same in Japan. There's nothing unusual about listening to bureaucrats, but you gotta stay in the job for a while so that the bureaucrats will also listen to you. If the bureaucrats think, well, you know, this Okyaksama is gonna be around for six months and we get rid of him and there'll be another guy, and by the time he figures out what's going on, he'll be gone, you're not gonna have much in the way of political leadership. So I give Abe a lot of credit for this decision, which is, you know, not popular. <clears throat> I was talking with one cabinet minister in this government this summer uh, over dinner, and, and uh, I, I, bet, I don't want to say what, what the ministry was, but, um, uh, uh, but I was, you know, I was saying, I'm not gonna put this. You know, what you want to do is really good, and, and um, but, you know, it's gonna take, takes real effort, and you gotta keep at it. Something like that. And he said, yeah, I said, I, 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 know, I know that. He said, but you know, um, how long I stay in this job, first of all, it depends on the prime minister, so it's not my decision. But more importantly, there's a long line of LDP members who have been elected you know, six times or more, which is kind of the, the, when you get to be a cabinet minister, that are waiting online to get in. So I can't stay here for too long because then they'll be very, you know, they'll be, uh, There'll be a lot of frustration in the party. So I give Abe credit. There is a lot of frustration. There are people who are really disappointed. They're not gonna be cabinet ministers. But I think he's trying to change the game. More um, centered. Did you get enough pictures of me yet? Thanks. <laughs> it's kind of dis disconcerting after all. Uh, <laughs> um, I think Abe is, is trying to change the policy process in a number of ways. Much more Kante, that is, you know, prime minister office, office centered. Um, it's going to create a national security council. I got, you know, I have my doubts about that, but, but nonetheless, he wants to get more power centered at the prime minister's office and keep his cabinet ministers around long enough so they really understand what their ministries are supposed to be doing and can engage with the bureaucrats and work with them to get, to get things done. So those are all really interesting and important changes going on uh, in, uh, in politics. Now, what he also learned from the three no's uh, is that he better stop talking about utsukushi kuni and um, you know, beautiful country and constitutional revision when he doesn't have the votes to bring it about and talk about what the public is interested in. And just like here, it's the economy, it's the economy stupid. That's what 
That's the intro. That's why people really want to find out about is what are you going to do to improve our economic conditions? And so he has focused his attention like a laser beam on the economy. And you know, it was quite amazing because in early when he was prime minister the last time, he didn't really speak with a great deal of authority or or apparent deep knowledge about financial and economic issues. But he came out um, of, the, um, of, of the election with a package of economic reforms and really quite brilliant branding. Abenomics, three arrows. Uh, Known all, not only you know, to every Japanese, but if you go to Wall Street, you know, what's happening with the third arrow? That's the question people, you know, structural reform. What's happening with the third arrow? So the branding is very, very, is, is very clever. Um, and so far, his approach has worked. Um, he was lucky. Uh, I think obviously has been lucky in, in many ways, but um, uh, he was lucky that the term of the governor of Japan expired in March so that he was able to replace the governor uh, with someone who would commit to an inflation target that Abe insisted the Bank of Japan adopt or else he was gonna force a, a, law th a bill through the diet to amend the BOJ law to reduce its independence. Uh, and so he got, uh, you know, Mr. Kuroda came from the Asia Development Bank, former finance ministry, um, uh, uh, high level official uh, who very much, um, Supports this policy and has pushed the bank to a very to a very aggressive, aggressive, um, aggressive stance. So as a result of it, of the new BOJ policies, you know the yen is depreciated. There's been a boom for export industries, and sentiment among the public and on Wall Street uh, has shifted, and people have become cautiously optimistic. And I say that. Uh, advisedly, cautiously optimistic. There is, you know, you, the public opinion polls are still show the public is uh, doesn't doesn't quite believe it, or how long how how long this uh, whether this is for real over over a longer period of time. But it's surely much more optimistic than than has been in years, and they've begun to loosen their their purse strings. So uh, growth is strong, and when you read uh, Hugh Patrick's uh, annual report on the Japanese economy, which is hot off the print. I don't know when it's coming out very soon, right? It's done, and it's really good, and uh, you can get the details. Um, and now Abe is trying to push, to put pressure on business to raise wages so that consumers have more disposable income and also share in this, share, you have a feeling of sharing in this growth more. So, uh, um, but there too, so that's the that that's really an arrow which I think so far looks as though it's really kind of hit the the bullseye. He wanted the BOJ to, to be very aggressive and push for an inflation target and do as necessary to get Japan out of deflation, and it's moving in that direction. But there are two more arrows in Abenomics: fiscal stimulus and structural reform. Right? Well. <clears throat> You know, there's nothing new about the second arrow, that is deficit finance, fiscal spending. This is traditional LDP policy. This is the policy that over these past 20 years has produced some growth and also made, given Japan, the largest government deficit of any of the advanced economies. So. I think Abe did the right thing in deciding to raise the consumption tax by three points uh, to 8%. It's coming April, 10% the following April. I don't know if he's announced it. I don't know if he's officially announced it, but, he's, but it's, it's a done deal. He will announce that if he hasn't already. I, think, I guess he hasn't announced it, but beginning of October he's gonna announce it. Uh, <clears throat> I think that's really wise, <clears throat> even though Many economists, um, including uh, some of my favorite colleagues here at Columbia, um, think it's too soon uh, to, uh, to, to raise taxes. There's never a good time to raise taxes. Uh, and politically, I think it would have been foolhardy 
to back away from a policy that the LDP had argued for for years and for which the DPJ paid the political price of actually getting it through the diet. Uh, but the, the concern that the consumption tax is going to have a, uh, a dampening effect on economic activity is real. And so now the government is planning to pass a big supplemental budget before the end of the year, probably about five, mil, five trillion yen, to offset the negative effects of, uh, on spending of the consumption tax increase. So in short, Japan <clears throat> is still far away from getting its fiscal house in order. And if, and if the consumption tax increase does have the, the impact that a lot of economists fear it will on contracting uh, 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 activity, economic activity, then the budget and the budget deficit will continue to grow. The next budget already, it's certain to be the largest budget ever with the largest reliance on deficit financing ever. And I, don't, I think the idea that Japan is going to grow its way out of its fiscal hole is an illusion. So, um, and the idea that at some point in the next few years, the economy is going to be humming along so nicely that people will readily accept, accept further tax increases, I think that's fairyland talk. So it's going to be a long time after this uh, increases the, the two, going to 10% in 2015. It's going to be, it's going to take a while before any prime minister advocates further increase in the consumption tax. So some economists who, uh, uh, whose views I, I, I respect say Japan has to move to the consumption tax to European levels, 20% or so VAT um, by 2020 to avoid a major bond crisis, it's not going to happen until the crisis, at least until the crisis stares them right in the face. I don't see any, any way that's going to be preempted. Now, the third arrow, which is what a lot of people are interested in, structural reform. That's what I'll spend a few minutes talking about before I go into the foreign policy issues. I don't think there's any reason, I don't see any evidence to expect that there's much that's going to be done, much more that's going to be done in the, in the, in the area of structural reform. I'll give you the two or three major issues that are big structural reform issues about which nothing much is going to be done. One is labor market reform. Labor market reform that would make it easier for companies to fire so-called redundant workers. There's so much resistance to this. This goes right to the heart of, um, of, of, of you know, Japanese approaches to, um, to um, uh, how to treat employees. Abe's tried to bring together labor union leaders, K. Danren, and the government, and government uh, representatives to talk about wage increases. Well, it's interesting. You would think labor unions would be interested in a conversation mediated by the government with business about raising wages. The labor unions, Rengo, is very, very um, resistant, um, uh, very reluctant to get sucked into this dialogue because they fear that the price they would have to pay for wage increases, or an agreement on wage increases, would be an agreement to make it easier for companies to fire people. And companies, while they're ready to consider Many of them are considering increasing bonus payments, are loath to commit to wage increases, to an increase in what Japanese call the base up. The base up, the basic wage. Once you set it, it's very hard to lower the floor. So companies don't want to lock themselves into a position where they got a new higher base up, and then the, then the economy turns sour. So I think rigidities in the labor market, of course, they'll be relaxed over time, but over a long time, um, uh, not, uh, not quit quickly. Now, another issue, and apparently Mr. Abe is going to use his time in his UN speech, from what I understand, not to talk about Syria, not to talk about uh, 
inter international security issues, but you know what he wants to talk about? He's going to talk about women. Prime Minister Abe is going to talk about women. I don't know why you're laughing. All I said was Prime Minister Abe is going to talk about women. Uh, you know, I think there's very little this government, or maybe any government, but this government can do or will do to change attitudes and change policies relevant to the role of women in Japanese society. <clears throat> um, it's changing. I need not tell you, especially you know, those of you who are Japanese and in this room, including a lot of women in the audience, that things are changing. Attitudes are changing, and women are playing increasingly important roles in the economy. But the underutilization and the discrimination against women in the workplace is not something that's going to be overturned very quickly. Uh, here are some, just some numbers that are really quite, quite, quite startling. So members of board of directors. Only 1.6% of members of board of directors in Japanese companies are women. Only 15% of Japanese companies have any female executive whatsoever. It's not great anywhere, but in Europe, women account for about 14% 14, 14 of board members. And Mr. Abe talks about having a goal of 30% of women on boards and in executive positions by 2020. This is what he's going to talk about. I haven't been able to get a copy yet of the UN speech. But this is what he's going to make a big, he's going to talk a lot about in, at the UN. 30% of women on boards by 2020. For some reason, this 30% is a very popular number all around the world for women on boards. I don't know, why should you only be 30%, not 40%, not 50%? You have the population, after all. But 30% is it. So in Great Britain, there's the 30% club. This is a club of chairmen, men, chairmen of of uh, British corporations who are committed to bring more women into, onto UK corporate boards. Malaysia passed a law in 2011 requiring 30% of board members to be women within five years. Uh, uh, and now Abe has his 30%, his 30% uh, his 30%, um, his 30% goal. But what is he going to do policy-wise to move towards that goal? By the way, this is also Keizai Doyukai adopted, adopted goal. What's he going to do to, 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 um, to go there? He's given a speech, I think, right now at the, stock, at the New York Stock Exchange. I got a copy of that one in advance. And as I read it, the only concrete policy he mentions in that speech uh, is that they're going to increase the number of daycare center uh, placements, uh, you know, position, places to 250,000 within, within a couple of years, and I think 400,000 over a somewhat longer period of time. Well, that's terrific. Actually, that's pretty good. That's, that's very good. And that surely might help uh, working women uh, with children both have, you know, take care of the, take care of the, there aren't enough daycare, daycare centers, but you've got to have, you've got to train people work in take care centers, and that's not the answer, the, the entire answer to the problem. So, um, so uh, in Europe, there's been a lot of, there's been increasing, this issue of getting more women into, into executive positions, you know, it's a, it's a global um, uh, issue. And in Europe, in, in Germany and in other countries, um, there's been moves towards actually mandating requirements for, for, for women on, for a number of women on boards. Apparently, Norway is um, uh, in, sort of in the lead on this. It, in Norway, the law now requires, requires companies to appoint women to the board of directors. There's been nearly 100% compliance since the law was changed. Some 40% of board members in Norway and Norwegian companies are women. Is Abe going to push for legal changes to mandate companies to hire a certain number of women in executive positions? Not a chance. <clears throat> so I think his talk about increasing the number of women executives is likely to end up 
being just that, talk. Moreover, some companies in Japan already appoint a token woman to be on their board. You're going to see many more do that in the coming years. Since there aren't all that many women who are, uh, that they know of to, be, to serve on boards, the same women are serving on more boards than you can imagine, running around from one board meeting to another. You think they're playing a role in these companies? Very doubtful. Um, so I don't think, you know, I think this is all cosmetic, cosmetic surgery. Uh, it doesn't change, there's nothing to change the reality of the underutilization of women in the workplace. Here's another interesting number. In the US, UK, and Germany, 50 to 60% of women with young children work. In Sweden, it's 75%. In Japan, it's about a third, only about a third of women with young children uh, when children work, for, you know, for obvious reasons. So maybe Abe, I shouldn't, you know, I, Abe should be given credit or could be given credit for trying to raise public consciousness about the problem of working women or of, work, of yeah, work, to, to, about this, this problem. But I think it's a big mistake to think that there's either support in the LDP, much support in the LDP for gender equality, um, or that Abe has an arrow in his quiver to do something significant about it, or what is probably most important, that there is some kind of a dramatic change going on in how Japanese men in executive positions think about the role of women in their companies. I don't think anything's got, this is not what's happening in Japan. Um, so, you know, if you have a long enough time horizon, over the next 10, 15 years, more women, no doubt, will occupy more important positions in Japanese corporate life. They do now more than they did 10 years ago. So over time, yeah, sure, over time, things will get, the situation will change. But the idea that this government is going to take decisive action to deal with this problem of the, um, of the underutilization and the discrimination against women uh, at work in Japan, I don't think there's anything to it. Um, so, so it seems to me there's no quick fix to Japan's demographic problem, that is, its shrinking and aging population. Major immigration is not in the cards. In fact, it's not talked about. Uh, it's surely not part of this government's um, uh, agenda at the moment. Getting women, um, the, the point I just made, and you know, getting women to both work and marry, have children, that's not something that the government or industry is going to be able to do very much about very, very quickly. So, so this is my take. Uh, uh, so I think that the economic situation at present, uh, looked at from a you know, political scientist's point of view, uh, and someone who looks at the impact of, on, 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 on attitudes and so on, rather than the, 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 the straight economics of it. The economic situation looks very positive, and Abe deserves credit for that, mainly because he's changed the mood. Changed the mood in Japan, changed the mood among foreign investors, and that's driven up uh, the stock market. But the longer term outlook for the economy is cloudy. Uh, he wants to, in, to create greater incentives for greater business investment in Japan. Laudable goal, but the reality, as far as I can tell, is that Japanese corporate strategy to globalize and localize production in foreign markets and to take advantage of the cheaper labor costs outside Japan, that's not being changed by Abenomics. Uh, and far-reaching structural reforms are not yet on the agenda. They're not on the agenda, at least not yet on the agenda. So there's plans to create a uh, uh, strategic economic zone, Senyaku Toku in, in, uh, in Tokyo, to attract foreign investment. I don't know, it strikes me more as a gimmick uh, than, than something that's really real. So apparently in this you know, strategic economic zone, foreign medical doctors will be able to practice without having a Japanese license. What are they going to do about nurses? What are they going to do about 
babysitters for their, for their, for their children. You know, in other countries, you can bring, uh, if you're in Singapore, so you find, you know, someone from Malaysia or the Philippines or Hong Kong or wherever comes and they work for you. You can't do that in Japan. There's a whole range of issues that have to be dealt with to make real structural reform. Does Japan want them? Is it what Japan should have? That discussion really isn't going on all that much. Even in agriculture, the other big structural reform issue, it's not clear to me at all how much reform there's going to be. So TPP, you know, this Trans-Pacific Partnership negotiation, that should that will produce, assuming that it is ever concluded, you know, it's supposed to be over at the end of this by to the end of 2013. I wouldn't hold my breath and expect that to actually happen or if it does, that it really amounts to very much. But at some point, maybe TPP will be concluded. That should produce something in the way of further opening the Japanese agricultural market. Um, but I don't think my, what I see is that, is that Abe is not, doesn't seem to be prepared to force the kinds of changes in land ownership rights the, and the right to convert agricultural land to non-agricultural use that would help deal with Japan's basic agricultural problem. What is Japan's basic agricultural problem? It's that the farming population is dying off. The average age of farmers now is 66. And very few of their children want to follow in their footsteps. And those who are willing to do so increasingly have to go outside Japan for wives because Japanese women don't want to be, be stuck in, uh, in a rice paddy. And they'd rather be in, 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 this, in, in Tokyo. So I've, you know, friends of mine in, uh, in, in the countryside, politicians that I've gone to visit, you go visit and so many of the farmers um, have foreign wives, Asian wives, China, Philippines, uh, Thailand, uh, and, and, some, and Korea, and, and so on. So, you know, the, the American occupation, those, I have a number of students here who are, who didn't necessarily want to come today, but knew they had no choice because they're in my class. Uh, so they heard me talk a little bit about this, uh, this last time. But the American occupation had a very dramatic um, and, and important agricultural uh, reform that ended landlordism and created a large class of independent and politically conservative farmers. But now they need an equally ambitious reform to make it possible for corporations to manage large tracts of farmland. But, that, but there's huge resistance to this within the Ministry of Agriculture and elsewhere. The argument that you get from the Ministry of Agriculture is that corporations, uh, you can't trust corporations if they buy up all this land uh, to stay in the agricultural business if it doesn't produce enough profit. And so thereby there's the danger that they'll abandon their investment and farmland will be left fallow. And Abe has made comments that indicate his sympathy for this point of view. So I'm not so sure you're going to see all that much in the way of major agricultural reform in Japan. That I don't think you're going to see much in the way of labor market reform in Japan. I think to talk about reform of the role of women in Japanese society is a lot of talk and not much more than that. Uh, so as far as I can see, other than the inflation targeting, which has had a big impact, I don't see much change in Japanese economic policy, except for the PR surrounding it, which has been really pretty terrific. OK, enough. Let me talk about foreign policy. Um, quickly. quickly? 45 minutes? <laughs> I got a lot to tell you about foreign policy. Wow. All right, I'll try to be quick. Uh, so, you know, Abe is part of the more conservative ideological wing of the LDP. He wants to free Japan, as he puts it, from the post-war regime, Senguri regime no dakyaku, meaning freeing it from the system established as a result of the U.S. occupation's reforms and from the pacifist and passive mindset and the alleged <coughs> lack of pride in the nation's history that resulted from defeat in the war and from the view of Japan's culpability for the war that were propagated by the occupation, the Tokyo War Crimes Trial, and the Japanese left. You know, he wants to revise the Constitution from start to finish so that it's a Japanese Constitution, not one drafted by the Americans. 
He wants to visit Yasukuni as prime minister, expressed regret that he didn't do so when he was prime minister the last time. He wants to reform the education system to instill a greater sense of patriotism, love of country, and young people. He wants Japan to stand shoulder to shoulder with other so-called tier one countries, a phrase which I don't believe exists in the IR, in the academic IR literature, but, but I think seems to have been coined by, by Richard, uh, Rick, uh, Rich Armitage um, in the Armitage Naya report, and which Abe has latched onto. We're a tier, we're gonna be a tier one country. Uh, so there's this ideological side to Abe, but just like his grandfather, Prime Minister Kishi, uh, uh, and others on the right wing. He's a pragmatist and a realist. He's an ideologue, but not an unrealistic ideologue. He's not gonna push his views come what may. He's a cautious hawk. He's a cautious hawk looking to strengthen Japan's military capabilities and expand the military's roles and missions, but careful not to alienate the US in the process or provoke major opposition to his policies at home. Uh, I don't think what he's done so far at this time as prime minister justify the attacks on him as an extreme right winger or a, or a, you know, a, 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 or a hawk. Yes, in, his bud, in the first budget he passed, he raised the defense budget, first time in 11 years. You know how big the, the increase was? 0.8%. In the coming budget, it's gonna be raised probably a little bit higher. The, the defense minister has asked for 3%, it's not gonna get 3% but it'll get something, a little bit more than 0.8. Is this a lot? No, this is not a lot. The Chinese military budget goes up double digits every year, and the Chinese complain about Japan becoming, uh, about Japanese militarism? Give me a break. Well, give Japan a break. That's nonsense. <clears throat> uh, so he's been both cautious and an activist in trying to raise Japan's profile in regional and global affairs. He's been a really enthusiastic salesman for Japanese business abroad. Travels overseas at least once a month. His preferred destination, Southeast Asia, where he's sought not only closer economic ties, uh, but political ties as well. So you know, he, here we talk about Obama's pivot, pivot to East Asia. The most dramatic pivot in East Asia has been Japan's aggressive courtship, economically and diplomatically, of countries in Southeast Asia where it is an enormously popular country. Public opinion polls throughout Southeast Asia, I like Japan, more than 93% of the respondents say so. In, Japan, in, in China and Korea, less than 5%. That's Japan's problem. So the big problem for Japan, how to manage relations with China and Korea. Once you move beyond Northeast Asia, Japan's a popular country, ASEAN, India, and elsewhere. But that should not be of great solace to the Japanese. It'd be like saying, the US is a popular country, except that the Canadians and the Mexicans hate us. <laughs> no, you gotta get along with your neighbors. You gotta figure out how to get along with your neighbors. And the reason it's so, it's so, there's so much trouble with Korea and Japan has a lot to do with the war and with the history of Japanese colonization of Korea uh, and the war with China. Either, you, depending how you count, it either lasted for what? Uh, for eight years, from 1937 to 1945, or, or for 13 years, starting in 1932 at the Manchurian incident to, to 1945. The issue, the interesting issue, and I'm sorry I don't have a lot of time to talk uh, about it today, but the interesting issue is why now, 68 years after the war ended, is this issue of, of history more of a, of a hot potato in relations with China and Korea than it's been in the past? And I think a key, a key reason is this. <clears throat> in Japan, time has dulled, really dulled the awareness of the terrible pain and suffering that the Japanese government and military caused in China and Korea and in other countries and to Japan's own people while in China and Korea. Resentments against Japan for what Japanese did to them long ago that were long suppressed because of the exigencies of the Cold War and economic development goals, now face no such constraints. Let me just talk a couple of minutes about Yasukuni Shrine, which I think captures this. So, you know, in the case of Yasukuni, 
In the years following the end of the war, there were deep, deep, bitter divisions among Japanese about how to handle Yasukuni. To many people, especially to the bereaved families of the war dead, it was the hallowed final resting place for the spirits. You know, there are no graves at Yasukuni. This is so much, much misunderstood abroad. Nobody's buried at Yasukuni. The spirits of those who died fighting for the nation are, are what, are, are, is what is at Yasukuni. So the spirits of the fathers, the husbands, the sons who died on the battlefield fighting for their country. That's what Yasukuni is about. But for others, Yasukuni was mainly about being the symbol of state Shinto and state Shinto's role in Japan's descent into militarism and war. Seven decades later, with the shrine having been free of direct government control since the occupation, these divisions have lost their salience. So the view that it is none of China or Korea's business, whether the prime minister goes to Yasukuni or not to pay respects to the war dead, uh, is just that. It's none of their business. Uh, uh, and, that, and I think that view has gotten, strong, has gotten stronger as the meaning of Yasukuni in Japanese history has faded from Japan's collective memory. But for Koreans and Chinese, the enshrinement in Yasukuni of uh, men convicted of war crimes evokes memories that are still very painful and symbolize what they regard as Japan's failure to adequately acknowledge and atone for its aggression. This issue is fraught with danger. Abe has expressed regret that he did not visit Yasukuni the last time when he was prime minister. I know that some of his advisors have said, wait, wait until your last year in office, and then go, just before you leave. But don't go sooner than that. But what he will do, I really don't know. But if he visits Yasukuni uh, this year or, or whatever, if he visits Yasukuni, it's bound to provoke a sharp, a sharp reaction in China and Korea. And that is almost, it was, is certain to provoke a strong counter reaction in Japan. Why are you, what are you telling us about how we respect the war dead? This is a very nasty issue. Yeah, it could be solved or resolved maybe if the, if the spirits of the convicted war crime uh, criminals were, were moved to another shrine. But the government can't force that. And the shrine priests have always argued that once enshrined at Yasukuni, you're not going to be moved out. They're not going to do it. And so one idea is to create an alternative site, memorial. Not going to work. So I think in the end of the day, you just have to hope that Abe's pragmatism will trump his ideological convictions, convictions that his head will win out over his heart, and that uh, he'll abstain from going to Yasukuni while he's prime minister. Uh, and one also has to hope that the Chinese and Koreans will recognize that their national interests are not served by ratcheting up tensions over history with Japan. And that to do so, to raise, you know, in order to attract domestic support, to deflect criticism from the regime by directing it outside, very dangerous game to play. But I'm very, I don't see any reason for optimism on, on this score. Um, I'll skip over a little bit of this really good stuff. Uh, 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 and, go to, and go here. So Japan's accused of not making adequate apologies. And it's true, God only knows it's true, that every time the Japanese government has made an official apology, no sooner has it been announced than important politicians, including members of the cabinet, have made statements uh, or taken actions like visiting Yasukuni that undermine those apologies. Uh, and it doesn't help when the, when the prime minister refuses to acknowledge in the diet that Japan committed aggression in Asia in the Second World War, a denial you know, that Abe made recently, but that did not begin with him. Most prime ministers since the LDP came to power have said the same thing. They, won't, they don't necessarily believe and won't say that Japan committed aggression in, uh, during the Second World, Second World War. Uh, but I think the fact remains, nonetheless, that Japan has made the most profound apology possible for its behavior during the war by rejecting the use of military power to secure foreign policy goals ever since. That's quite, an, wait, that's quite an atonement. It's Japan, it's not China, that's the exemplar of a peaceful rise. And in addition, having, you know, through its ODA and uh, trade and investment made 
major contributions, critical contributions to both Korea and China's economic development. Now, territorial disputes, um, um, I don't think Takashima issue is a big issue. The Japanese are not going to contest Korea, con Korea, con Korean control over Dokdo. Uh, if the Koreans would stop talking about it, the Japanese government would not have to, wouldn't respond. No one's going to, they're not going to challenge this. Senkaku is the problem. Uh, very dangerous problem. Um, uh, it didn't start with the Japanese nationalization of the islands in 2012, but it sure was, was exacerbated by that decision by Prime Minister, uh, Prime Minister um, uh, uh, Noda. Uh, what to do about the Senkakus? I think it's clear both sides want to avoid a military confrontation, at least for now. Um, and that is the Chinese, at least for now. The Japanese really don't want it uh, ever. Um, but neither side is willing to take that first step to make a concession to reduce tensions. And there are no mechanisms in place or understandings in place for managing the situation should a crisis arise. Two ships collide, sailors thrown overboard die. That's the, that's the dangerous scenario. The Abe administration's position, there is no dispute. It's Japanese territory, nothing to talk about. Um, the Chinese are determined to press their claim that the islands belong, belong to them. The US position is to be neutral on sovereignty issue. You work it out, folks, Ch Japan and China. Uh, but to commit, to agree that we have an obligation to support Japan in, in the case of a war because it's part of the territory administered by Japan, which is what the Security Treaty um, Article 5 uh, refers, uh, refers to. Uh, 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 I think, well, I know, Japan sent a signal earlier this year, in the summer, to the Chinese, suggesting a way out of this uh, cul-de-sac. Japan was prepared to say, I think, I'm, not, I'm pretty sure this is, I, I, from what I know this is true. Japan was prepared to say <clears throat> that while it stays to its, sticks to its position, there is no dispute to be negotiated. <clears throat> the Senkaku issue is, quote, a foreign policy problem between China and Japan that needs to be talked about. So that's a way to say, let's talk about it while maintaining the position that they're not going to talk about it. Uh, and the quid pro quo that the Japanese asked of the Chinese was that, in return, China would agree to keep government ships, that is, Coast Guard ships, fishing vessels are not, are, are not an issue, keep government ships out of the contiguous walk, waters around, um, around, around Senkaku. And there was considerable optimism among the topmost people in the LDP government that I spoke to this summer that the Chinese would buy into this deal. But I think the evidence now is that that optimism was unwarranted. They haven't bought into it, and probably because they don't believe that it would lead to significant negotiations, since Abe is very firm in his position. There's nothing to talk about. Um, and probably out of fear that any sign of softening towards Japan um, would create a strong, strong domestic criticism of the regime uh, in China. So. But the, the, here's the point. If the Chinese think that intimidating Japan is going to force it, bring Abe to, is going to get Abe to change his, his strategy, they're very wrong. He is going to be very tough on this issue. That's not the way to deal with this, with this prime minister. Um, so I am not optimistic or confident that there's really any way to calm the waters. I don't think they want to, either side wants to escalate it much further, but there's always the danger of miscalculation, accident. But I think the Japanese are making a mistake. They would be wise to take the initiative and publicly request China to ask, this, to, to ask to bring this issue before the International Court of Justice. That's what the Japanese demanded the Koreans in the case of Takeshima. <clears throat> and Chuck, you know, Korea takes the same position on Dokto, Takeshima, that the Japanese do on the Senkaku. It's our territory, none to talk about. But the Japanese say, no, we should settle it by applying international law. Well, if you can apply it to Takashima, apply it to Senkaku. If nothing, the Chinese will refuse, most likely, but if nothing else, it would be a, a big PR, you know, public relations advantage for Japan and get more international support for Japan by saying, we're ready to take it to the international court. It's the Chinese that want to use force rather than the rule of law to solve this issue. Uh, but I don't think it's going to happen. Finally, 
and I'll stop. Finally, give me. Yeah, I heard finally. You heard finally, <laughs> but you haven't heard the rest. Uh, <laughs> finally, what about what about the overall Japanese security policy under Abe? Uh, that's too long, uh, but. <laughs> I'll, I'll just tell you this, and then I, I won't give you my answer to it, but this is the question. Abe did an interview with a South Korean magazine. The editor said, you know, here in Korea, you have a reputation for being an extreme right winger. You want to change, change the interpretation of the Constitution to allow for collective defense. You want to change the name of the self-defense forces to be the National Defense Military, Kokubogun. You're an extreme right winger. What do you have to say to that, Prime Minister Abe? And Abe's response was, wait a minute. You here in Korea, you have a collective defense agreement with the United States. You have the right of collective defense, that is to come to the aid of another country, not only have that country come to your aid. You call your military a military. If I'm an extreme right winger, you're extreme right wingers, and the world is extreme right wing. All I want is Japan to be a normal country. What's wrong with that? What's the, what is the answer to that except, yeah, he's right. I think most Japanese would say, that seems to make a lot of sense. It does make a lot of sense. But there's one problem, and that is the abysmal lack of trust in East Asia uh, between Japan and Korea and, and, and China. So that the question is, I mean, it, changing the interpretation to allow collective defense is long overdue, in my view. But this is a question of timing and intention and goal. Why now? What purpose? What do you want to do that you cannot do without changing the interpretation? There isn't enough discussion of what this is supposed to mean in real policy. And without that discussion, it just raises all kinds of suspicions about what real intentions are. This is not good. So what the situation in East Asia is that, in Northeast Asia, is that there's a huge security dilemma. You know this expression. Countries do things in their own, what they think is in their own self-defense, but it's taken by other countries as being aimed against them and threatening them. So China builds up its military to defend itself. It's seen as a threat by Japan, and the Japanese now doing, doing the same. How do you get out of this security dilemma? Well, you have to be, you have to try to find ways to build better linkages, more trust, and eventually something that we call a security community. A security community, a community in which resort to the use of force, no matter how serious the controversy, is simply not considered within, it's not, it's not considered part of, the, part of the package of options. That's the European Union. That's the relation between the US, Canada, and, and Mexico. That's ASEAN. That is not Northeast Asia. So I think what's missing in this uh, foreign policy of Mr. Abe is a much more innovative, imaginative uh, vision for how to improve relations with China and Korea. It's up to Japan to do more in this, res in this regard. I don't think it's doing it. I had lots more to say, but as usual, I talk too long. I'm gonna stop, thank you. I, I allowed you to continue because what you were saying was really interesting, and, uh, and not because we we're friends particularly, but uh, I thought that particularly we wanted to hear about foreign policy, and, and uh, I loved what you had to say about economics. You almost sounded like an economist. Uh, I, spent too much, uh, I spent so much time with you, that's right. Uh, but uh, uh, I think I, what I'm going to do is take a few minutes away from the reception, and I, I'm supposed to spend five minutes saying thank you, but I'll do that in about 30 seconds. Uh, so uh, let, let's open it up for questions. Uh, uh, who wants to ask the first question? Uh, yes. Do we have microphones down here? Uh, do we have mics on each side? Uh, okay. Do we have another question over here? I'm gonna, I just want to... All right. Go ahead. Sure. Yeah, if you could talk a bit about Abe's personality profile and leadership style. And he, here, here's what I'm concerned about. Can you, can you identify I'm sorry, I'm Richard Katz. I'm the editor of the Earth Economist Report, and write for Toyota Keizai Magazine in Japan. So the question is Abe's personality style, leadership style. It seems to me 
that a lot of the decisions that Abe has made, whether they're right or they're wrong, have been governed by, uh, except for the BOJ stuff, but except for that, by uh, actually a very risk-averse approach. The way he's dealt with the consumption tax is sort of trying to put the path of least resistance. He'll go along with the tax, but he'll offset it a bit. The way he's dealt with the lack of labor reform, or a lot of numbers, but no action. Question. So the question is, is he, is he, he has this image of being bold, but is he in fact somebody who is by personality and leadership style actually not going to make the bold moves? A little bit more like this, more, more risk averse is really the word. I don't know that he's risk averse. I, I don't think that's the way to, that I would characterize him as risk averse. I think he, he has some very uh, ambitious goals about constitutional revision, about um, uh, foreign policy in particular. On economic policy, it's a, it's a, it's a little peculiar. So, and I think on those issues, he's just he's trying to build public support. Now, he plans to be around as prime minister for four, five, five years. He's, he wants to, you know, increase the LDP um, number of seats in the next upper house election three years from now. He's taking his time. He's trying to build support for his for his views. It's very strategic in, in, a, in a very unusual, unusual way. I think on the economic policy, particularly on the structural reform issues, it's not risk averse. I don't think he himself is personally convinced that what a lot of the free market reformers advocate is really what he wants to do. This is not Koizumi. Uh, he's much more kind of an an older style of, L, more of LDP politician that sees a bigger role for government. You know, it's not, it's not in, um, simply coincidence that he surrounded himself mostly with advisors from, from Mehdi. Um, this is a guy who wants to keep his hands on things and the economy. I don't think he necessarily buys into the idea that, that dramatic labor reform is really a good thing. Um, so I think he's kind of, he's risk averse in the sense that he does, that he, he's trying to avoid alienating either the, the free market reformers or, or the, the more mainstream LDP people. But I don't think this, you know, I think it's a mistake to think of Abe as a, as a, as the kind of, of advocate of political reform of Koizumi and holding people like Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan up as their, as their, as their models. Have you, I, I don't think, I, I should do a check, but I don't remember ever hearing Abe use the term chisa nasifu, small government. He doesn't talk about small government. Koizumi talked about small government all the time. He believed it. But he doesn't talk about small government. He doesn't really talk about, about reducing the role of the bureaucrats. No, this is not Mr. Abe. So this is different from being, from being risk averse. Question over here. Um, my name is Maya from the Japan Center for International Exchange. Kind of piggybacking on that question, I wanted to ask um, how much, I guess where do you think he is at right now with um, his political capital? So with I guess what? political capital, how much of that does he have to push through his more ambitious policy goals? And related to that, um, what's party discipline like right now? Are they, is he kind of on his own with a lot of these or? Do you think he'll be able to? I'm sorry, I didn't hit the last half. Where is his what? His party? Party discipline. Party discipline? Mm -hmm. Within the LDP for a lot of his more kind of ambitious and different sort of forward thinking goals. Um, well, as I said, um, uh, he's in a very strong position. There's very strong discipline in the party. No one, there's no contester. There's nobody who can contest uh, power with Mr. Abe, there's no leader in the LDP that has a chance to, to, uh, to challenge him. It's not like the old days of strong factional uh, politics in the LDP. Um, uh, of course, there, you know, there are constraints. You can't push too, too, too hard, too fast, I guess, on a lot of issues without getting, running into criticism at home. But look at his agricultural policy, you know, on agriculture, TPP. There's an enthusiasm. There's not enthusiasm in the LDP for joining the. There wasn't enthusiasm for joining TPP. But when he said he was going to do it, they all went, al went along with him like a bunch of lambs. So I think he's in a very strong position. As I said, I think the key issue here 
uh, is that it's not that he's not in charge, that he doesn't have a lot of power, but he's a realist. He understands that if he gets himself into big trouble with China and with Korea, it's going to be a problem for the United States. He doesn't want any problems with the United States. He understands that he can't push constitutional revision too fast because he can't get it done anyway. You need two thirds of the seats to pass the, you know, a, a bill to, to revise the constitution and then a public referendum. It can't happen because he doesn't have two thirds of the seats in the upper house. Uh, and, in this, and, and so he's being very, it's not risk averse, he's being very deliberate. I think he hopes and expects that he can be in office long enough to bring some of these more bold and dramatic changes about. Um, but that we'll have to see. Up here, yes. Um, my name is Xin Wei Li. Uh, I'm a junior at Barnard College. So you were talking about improving uh, its relationship with its neighbors, uh, such as China and Japan. But with all the history issues and tensions and Senkaku Island, Yakushini Shrine, um, how can Japan do exactly to improve its relationship with China and Korea? Thank you. Well, <coughs> so, you know, it's not a one-way street, as we say it takes two to tango. If there's no interest, if the Chinese government thinks that they somehow benefit by bashing Japan, they'll continue to do so, no matter what the Japanese do. And that's a real danger, that's a real possibility because it's a way to deflect a lot of domestic criticism against the, you know, about what's going on in their own country outside. And, and, and so that's a problem with Korea as well. Uh, uh, so, but I, so I think, you know, so, so, so that's one point. You gotta, it, there has to be a willingness on the side of the Chinese and the Koreans to improve relations with, with Japan. Uh, I tell my Chinese friends, if you want to really, if you want to see a real right wing government in Japan with a very hawkish foreign policy, just continue to, to, to deal with Japan the way you're dealing with it now. And it will happen because the, it's, it's, it's inevitable. That's the way the public will, will, will respond to this kind of, uh, of browbeating and you know, bashing uh, by China. Uh, but I think, especially on the Korean relationship, there are things Japan can do. I think it's a mistake to constantly resort to legalisms about the 1965 Normalization Agreement having resolved all issues um, emanating from the long period of colonization. That's, you know, then President Park, the father of the current uh, president, he had to send in uh, four battalions of, of soldiers into Seoul to restore order after that uh, uh, agreement was signed because of the huge uh, opposition to it. Uh, it's 60 years you know, it's 70 years after the war and the occupation of uh, the colonization of Korea has ended. Japan is a rich country. There are not many comfort women still alive. There are lots, there's, you know, the, the, the Germans continue to offer compensation, over, especially in, in, in recent years, uh, to people who, who, who suffered uh, 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 as a result of, of, of occupation policies, Germany and in Eastern Europe in particular, I think the Japanese would benefit from being much more magnanimous in dealing with these issues. Now, one reason why they don't is that the feeling that no matter what they do, the Koreans won't let this issue go. It's too convenient to use history to beat up on Japan as a way to rally public support behind the government in power. But I still think that it's a mistake uh, not to take that initiative, uh, especially on, on relations with Korea. And, I've always, and I tell my, my Japanese friends in the in Japanese government and, and, and so on, you know, this issue of comfort, which is a really awful, nasty, terrible uh, issue, um, that when, you know, a statue is, is, is put up to uh, honor these women in, in, you know, in New Jersey, 
the last thing the Japanese government should do is protest it and send you know, the Consul General out there to, to meet with the mayor to protest it. All that accomplishes is to get the issue into the local newspaper so that everybody who didn't know about this comfort women issue would be educated about it. You know, at the end of the war, the Prime Minister, when after the Potsdam Declaration was issued, he said, he used the expression, moksatsu. It was a wrong, it was not the right, the clever thing to do in that context. But Mokusatsu, just let it die by, with silence, you know, just be silent, let the damn issue, try not to make, make it worse. That's at the minimum what Japan should do, but I think they could be much more forthcoming on, the, on, the, uh, on, on relations with Korea, and it's really important to do so. Don't forget, Korea also is an ally of the United States. These three countries have a lot in common, a lot of common interests. Um, uh, and with China, um, I think, as I said, Japan should take the initiative in, in agreeing to, uh, in proposing that the Senkaku issue be brought before the International Court of Justice. Uh, in, 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 um, and in making, maybe there's a lot going on behind the scenes that I'm not aware of, but I think more can be done in, in trying to urge uh, a summit meeting between uh, uh, Xi Jinping and, and and, and, and Abe. But it's, it's very difficult. I'm not optimistic. Uh, I think right now it's just a time when these countries see advantages in alienating, in sort of what they think of as isolating Japan. So it's very important that the United States, and it's difficult for the US, it's very important that the United States make it clear to the Chinese that Japan is our ally and that if, if the Chinese create a lot of trouble in their relations with Japan, especially that lead to some kind of military con uh, uh, confrontation, that they're going to have to deal with us as well. So then the question is, how credible is that American message in light of what you know Obama's policies in Syria and elsewhere and so on? That's a big, it's a big if, and you just hope the Chinese don't mis in, misinterpret what is going on and 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 force the U us force the U.S. to face that question because we will defend Japan, other you know on the Senkaku issue. Otherwise, the security treaty is not is 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 just a piece of paper that's not going to be worth anything. That is not going to happen, I don't think. But also, we don't want to give Abe kind of a a free pass to do whatever he wants, uh, and then we're kind of hostage to his policies. So it's a, you know, this requires real diplomacy, as I think Obama has been finding out more and more. Foreign policy is about skillful diplomacy. We need to have a skillful diplomacy in dealing with this China-Japan uh, conf confrontation. You know, I, give, I think Abe gets it. He's trying not to escalate the issue. Um, he's trying not to do things and like put people on, actually put, put people on, on Senkaku. If he were to do that, that's, a, you know, red line is not a very convincing expression these days. Uh, but that would be a real red line for the Chinese. And I think it would make it very difficult for the U.S. to, um, to defend Japan if it's the Japanese that provoke a, con a, a confrontation. But even though the Japanese have kind of threatened that they might do that, they're not doing it. I don't think they will. That is, change that kind of, that changes the status quo in that very dramatic way. In that case, we're going to be defending Japanese interests. This alliance is critical to the U.S., and the Chinese better get it. Otherwise, um, it, it'll be very, very, very bad. I don't really have know what else I could say about this issue. Uh, I we, we're, we've already run past time. Yes, and uh, uh, and uh, I, I think. <coughs> I'm scared to get another question because I think that Jerry will have more and more to say. Um, uh, so I, I think what I want to say is that it's really good that he spent two days, not just one day, <laughs> typing this because we got a lot of information and ideas and insights. And I'm really glad he didn't spend three days typing this. <laughs> um, so Jerry, thank you so much.